Welcome everybody to this lecture on building mathematical optimization models. The agenda looks as follows. First, we will look into the model building process and discuss each individual step of it. Then we will study some examples of optimization models. We will discuss some aspects like the usage of binary variables versus general integer variables. And we will also present some general constraints that you can use within modeling, like combinatorial constraints or indicator constraints. Finally, we will present some advice on how to build good models and also how not to do it. So let's get started. What is modeling? A model is a simplified representation of reality, an approximation of reality. It is used instead of reality such that we can perform certain operations on it, in our case solving it by a MIP solver. Therefore, it has to fulfill certain formal requirements, which contributes to the simplification. In that sense, modeling mathematical optimization problems consists of describing a particular situation, a state of affairs, using a collection of logic and mathematical relationships between different quantities. In a mathematical optimization model, an objective function is used to evaluate alternative possibilities, while we use constraints to define the solution space of options that are considered feasible. Why do we build models? Most of the times, there are many different possible solutions to the problems that we are looking at, so we can't just enumerate all of them one by one. Moreover, what if scenarios might be difficult to evaluate, while a model might be better suited to get a comprehensive understanding of the problem? Finally, experimentation, hence testing alternative options in reality, might not be possible. In the model building process, we first must think about what is important for the situation and the problem under consideration. Then, we strive to find an abstraction of the complete problem. For example, a concrete way of navigating through a system of roads, with traffic lights and a traffic situation, could be abstracted to the notion of a shortest path in a graph. Then, all of the sudden, simplifications can yield tractable problems, whose solution are, however, still interpretable. Indeed, the problem of finding a shortest path in a graph is clearly computationally tractable. Further, each solution can be interpreted in terms of the original problem, by translating the abstract path into a concrete route through the system. As always in model building, this model is simply an abstraction of the original situation, any solution is just an approximation of the real one. For example, we did not consider the concrete setup of the traffic lights, at best the average time to pass a crossing, and we cannot take the future traffic into account, when the car will take the route. That's something to keep always in mind. In the model building process, we firstly have to identify the problem that we want to solve. This can be an abstract problem, like a combinatorial optimization problem, or a real-world application. Hence, we have to single out one concrete question, which we want to give an answer to. For example, what is the shortest path from A to B? This is where many practical applications already become hard. Indeed, in practice, we often don't have a single objective function but we want to optimize several objectives simultaneously. In most of the cases, it's better to concentrate only on one of these challenges at a time. Imagine you are the planner at a traffic transportation company, and you want to improve operations on your traffic network. You could ask yourself very different questions about that network. For example, what is the best frequency to operate lines on it? Which vehicles do you operate on which line at which time? Which of your staff should go on which vehicle at which time? Do the lines fit the requirements of the passengers or not? All of these are valid optimization questions, and a lot of them also have some interdependencies between each other, like the operation of the vehicles and the operation of the staff. You might consider to only address one of these at a time, and only think about integrated solutions once you can solve each of these questions separately. The next step consists of identifying the important features, which means to formulate this problem in mathematical notation. Hence, we define variables, write down equations on the blackboard, find a mistake, wipe the blackboard and repeat. We do what we know from our studies, we describe the problem using the language of mathematics. Here again, we should never forget that a model is only an abstraction of reality. 
To understand what this means, consider the traffic example of before. Suppose we have estimated a threshold of a thousand people that can fit into a subway at a time. Hence, in the sudden situation in which 1001 people want to travel on that line, the model will ask for another train, hence it will require to operate at a higher frequency. In the same situation, however, a planner would probably be more flexible and say, if we can fit a thousand people, we can also fit 1001. This sounds unmathematical and it is to a certain extent but be prepared to be challenged on such questions. Also keep in mind that the data used by the model usually relies on estimates. Maybe the 1001 is just an estimate plus minus 5%. As another example, in the shortest path problem of before, we can only get a good estimate of the time it actually takes to drive down a certain road, but we will never exactly know the travel time in advance. Then, we need to transfer the mathematical formulation of the problem that we have on the blackboard into a computer. For this, we typically make use of modeling tools. Hence, we either code this using a dedicated modeling language like Mosul or we use the Solver API in some programming language like Python. This phase represents a good opportunity to think about alternative formulations. Then, we fire up a MIP or LP solver, and find a solution to the model. We have to check the validity of the given solution in practice. Indeed, in most of the cases, our first modeling attempt will be trivially infeasible or unbounded, because we did an error in the translation of the Blackboard model to the computer model. Or we forgot some constraint, forgot to couple some variables and so on. Even when we get a solution which looks reasonable at a first glance, we will probably be told that the model was missing something, once we take it back to the project owner. This happens in almost every practical application. You will not be told about all requirements, either because you talk past each other or because the project owner assumed that certain conditions would be obvious. Which they probably are with the corresponding domain knowledge, but not for you as the modeling expert. Improvise. Adapt. Overcome. Finally, there is the deployment stage, where we have to design a procedure to implement this solution into practice. This is where a lot of OR projects fail. Indeed, we can build a model and find a solution with a MIP solver. Yet, this is only a proof of concept, at best. Once we have the solution, or think we have it, the question is, how do you put this into operation? How can a solution vector operate a traffic network? How resilient is our model to failure? There are specific deployment tools which build the bridge between the modeling expert and the practitioner. Deployment is one, if not the, most important step to make mathematical optimization successful in practice. As might have already noticed, this is not a linear process, but a cycle or rather a multitude of cycles. As you can see, at every single step there is feedback to the previous step. Each stage refines the previous stages and the modeling process helps in understanding the problem more and more. At each step, we might find a special situation which needs to be included into the modeling formulation at some previous stage. Until the final model, we might have to take several full passes of this loop, but certainly many small passes of error correcting subloops. Let's consider the knapsack problem to show a trivial example. Suppose a burglar has a knapsack with a capacity of 15 kilograms. When he breaks into a house, he finds several items, each one labeled with its weight and the value it is worth. The burglar wants to decide which of those to carry away. To model this as a mathematical optimization problem, firstly we have to specify the variables, the constraints and the objective. For each item we will use a binary variable, either 0 or 1, to represent the decision of taking the item or not. Do we put it into the knapsack or not? The single constraint is given by the capacity of the knapsack. The sum of the decision variables, multiplied by the weight of the items, has to be smaller than or equal to the capacity of the knapsack. This kind of constraints, where the variables are binary, while the coefficients and right inside integer, are indeed called knapsack constraints. Finally, we need to work out the objective, which, in this case, consists in maximizing the value that we get out of this housebreaking job. In other words, we aim to maximize the sum of the decision variables multiplied by the value of the items.
The objective here has been scaled by a factor 1000. This is the knapsack optimization problem from this tiny toy application. Let's talk about different variable types. Almost all MIP models, in practice, have at least some binary variables. In particular, in combinatorial problems, a lot of them are purely binary. Hence, a question that comes up again and again is when variables should be binary and when general integer. This is not an easy decision, but a certain rule of thumb can be applied. Integer variables should only be used to model actual quantities, when the order of them is relevant. To simply represent some different values, it's almost always better to use binaries instead of integers. For example, consider the Sudoku puzzle, where the task is to assign values between 1 and 9 to these 81 little squares, in such a way that no two identical values are in each row, each column and in each of the thicker marked 3 by 3 squares. A first naive intuition to model this problem might consist in using integer variables, with values between 1 and 9, for each of the 81 fields. However, we would then start to get into trouble when trying to formulate all the conditions that the variables must satisfy by linear inequalities. What we can do instead is to model this task only with binary variables. In particular, we will use a nice connection between Sudoku and a combinatorial optimization problem, namely the graph coloring problem, which some of you might have heard about before. How can we convert a Sudoku into a graph coloring problem? In a Sudoku, indeed, we can replace integer numbers with any kind of different items, without changing the task itself. For example, we can just use 9 different colors instead of integers between 1 and 9. Then, for each cell, we define a binary variable that encodes the color used for that cell, which is required to have exactly one color. This requirement can be formulated as the sum of the xijk equals 1, for each cell at position ij. Hence, for each ij we have a constraint, which guarantees that only one binary variable equals 1. If the variable xijk is equal to 1, then this means that color k is assigned to cell ij. To formulate the other rules of the game, we convert the Sudoku into a graph. Precisely, we insert an edge between any pair of cells that must not have the same color or number, for example, one edge between every two cells in the first row. Then, as we would do in graph coloring, for each pair of adjacent cells in each color, we introduce the constraint which tells that the sum of the corresponding variables has to be less than or equal to 1. For example, only one of the first two cells in the first row can be colored with color 1. However, using our knowledge about the Sudoku problem, which is more specific than graph coloring, we can do better by adding clique equations. For example, for row i and color k, we add the constraint that the sum of the variables over the columns has to be equal to 1, since we have to use each color exactly once in the clique. Hence, solving a Sudoku puzzle is equivalent to ask whether there is a feasible 9 coloring of a partially colored graph with 27 9 cliques. Once we have found an optimal coloring for that, we can convert this back to a solution for our Sudoku puzzle. Here you see the final model written out. What we used here is called an assignment structure. It specifies the cost for assigning object i to object or person j, where the assignment is done in a one-on-one -on -one fashion. This is called the assignment problem and is a very common substructure of other problems. The nice thing about modeling is that, once when we have a working model for one particular problem, adding extra constraints or variables, or slightly changing the definition of the problem, is usually easy. Indeed, the model used to solve a Sudoku could also be used for other kinds of combinatorial puzzles. For example, the X Sudoku, which has the further requirement that no number can be repeated in a diagonal. What do you need to change or add in the Sudoku model to get a model for the X Sudoku? Briefly think about it. The answer is, you have to add an additional set of constraints for the diagonals, just like you have it for the rows and columns. Easy. Another example is the 16x16 16 16 Sudoku. What do you have to change here? It is the number of variables.
instead of 9 times 9 times 9, you need 16 times 16 times 16 variables. Next example is a three-dimensional Sudoku. What do you have to change? Again it is in the variables. In your model, the variables have to get a fourth index. Another one is the ensimata, which has a round shape, and each number must only appear once in each ring, each cake piece and again in 3x3 three three subrings. What needs to be changed? Nothing. This is exactly a Sudoku, just printed in a different form, the model would be exactly the same. There is the killer Sudoku, which doesn't have any number given, but certain patterns within which the sum of the numbers has to correspond to the number printed in its corner. What would you need to change in your model? You would have to encode these new conditions as new equations. The sum of all variables corresponding to each involved cell, multiplied with the value they represent as a coefficient, has to be equal to the given number. Our last example is the comparison Sudoku, where again there is no number given in advance, but only the relations that the numbers in any pair of neighboring fields have to satisfy. What does this mean for your model? Again, you have to encode this as additional constraints, not surprisingly as inequalities. The sum of the nine variables from one square, again multiplied by the value they represent, had to be less equal the weighted sum of the nine variables of another square minus one. These puzzles are uniquely solvable. You can try to solve them for fun, but what I really advise you to do is to gain an understanding how to adapt the model for Sudoku to these different situations. While modeling a problem, there might be different choices. Some are crucial, some are negligible. Of course, the more complex the model is, the larger the number of alternatives. Some are better, some are worse. What works well in practice often requires a certain experience, but even with this experience, it often comes down to experimentation to evaluate different alternatives. This is what often makes the difference between a good and an excellent modeler. The latter one has more tools at hand and tries more variants of the model, to come up with the most competitive solution. For example, let's consider the TSP, which is arguably one of the most famous optimization problems. Given a complete graph with distances on the edges, the task in the TSP is to find a tour of all the vertices, called Hamiltonian cycle, of minimum length. In the classical, straightforward MIP formulation, there is a binary variable for each of the edges, specifying whether the edge is in the tour or not. Hence, in the end, out of the n squared edges, n should take a solution value of 1, while the others should take 0. Then, for each vertex, exactly two edges have to be taken, one entering and one leaving. However, these constraints alone are not enough, since they might allow subtours. For example, in the graph depicted in the figure, the red edges fulfill the constraints described so far, but they do not form a tour. Hence, additionally, we need to require that each subset of the vertices is crossed at least twice by the tour. For example, each of the two node sets on each side of the blue cut have to be entered and left at least once by the tour. These two sets of constraints together are sufficient to formulate the TSP as an integer program. However, as you might have already realized, the problem with this formulation is that it requires a constraint for each subset of the vertices, hence resulting in an exponential number of inequalities. We should note that, for really solving TSPs, straightforward integer programming is certainly not the best way. There are highly efficient, special-purpose codes, namely Concord, which can solve pure TSP problems which are orders of magnitude larger than what an integer programming solver can do for pure TSP. However, in the case in which the TSP is not pure, but has various additional constraints, then it could be necessary to rely again on an IP formulation, which allows to easily model those other side constraints. For larger graphs, what we can do is to use the so-called Miller-Tucker-Zemlin formulation, which dates back some 60 years. In this model, the TSP is interpreted on a directed graph, where each edge is replaced with two arcs, one forward, the other backward, 
IJ and JI. Again, there is a variable YIJ representing the decision of taking the arc IJ into the tour or not. Additionally, integer variables are used to get around the exponential formulation. In particular, UI encodes the number of nodes visited before the current node I. Hence, in the final result, those variables will correspond to a numbering of the nodes. In other words, there will be exactly one integer variable which has a solution of 1, exactly one with a solution of 2 and so on. This is an example where general integers are useful and they have a meaning as integers in the model since they represent an ordering. In the miller tucker zemlin formulation, there is again the requirement that exactly two arcs must be incident to each of the vertices, one outgoing and one ingoing. Hence, this requirement is here split into two parts. Moreover, one of the integer variables is fixed to zero, which essentially means that one city is randomly picked to be the first one visited in the tour. Then, for all the other ones, there is an additional constraint that looks at the ingoing edges. In particular, if the value of the ingoing edge is zero, then the last term vanishes and any difference between UI and UJ is allowed. However, if the value of the ingoing edge is 1, the difference will be forced to be equal to 1. There are many further variations of this model, which we will not go into detail on. The vive woolsey formulation is interesting, because an important experiment was performed on it. A group of researchers from ZIB considered various small changes. First of all, they observed that two conditions from the original model could be relaxed, while still keeping the same set of optimal solutions. Those might add suboptimal solutions, but the set of optimal solutions stays the same. Further, they observe that four additional restrictions could be added. Those are redundant and again the set of optimal solutions will stay the same when adding them. This gives 2 to the 6 equals 64 different versions of the same model with the same set of optimal solutions. In their paper, they showed that the performance of the solvers they used back then can differ tremendously. Some models would solve in seconds, others not in days. Note that this is in the same space, with the same base model, the same set of optimal solutions, the only difference is whether certain seemingly redundant conditions are added or not. For some of them, it is easy to explain why a solver would benefit from, for others, it requires a deep insight into the technology, or the knowledge that trying different variations often pays off. Keep that in mind. Okay, half time. Let's have a quiz. First question. Modeling a 9x9 Sudoku as integer program is best done with A. 81 general integer variables, or B, 81 binary variables, or C, 729 binary variables. Second question, where do most OR projects fail? Is this during the model formulation, or during the deployment, or during the solution finding? And third question, adding redundant information to a model, A, will not change the performance, B, will always slow down the solver, or C, might change performance dramatically in either direction. Think about the answers. And here come the solutions. So first question, modeling a Sudoku as integer program is best done with binary variables and you will need 729 of them to do so. Most OR projects fail in the last stage in the deployment. And third question, adding redundant information to a model might change performance dramatically in either direction. This is called performance variability. So let's now continue with some information on special kind of constraints. And we start with logical constraints. A logical constraint is any logical connection of binary variables of the form and, or, or XOR. In particular, the binary resultant of an end constraint of some operator variables is one or true, if and only if all the variables are one. In an OR constraint, instead, the resultant is one if and only if at least one variable is equal to one. Finally, an XOR constraint is true if and only if the number of true variables is odd. These constructs are often useful in modeling. However, the above formulation is not in terms of linear constraints. So, the question stands whether such logical constraints are easy to linearize. 
Surely, these constraint types are convenient for modeling. They are supported by many languages and solver interfaces, also together with constraints for minimum, maximum and absolute value. One advantage of having constraints with such a compact formulation in the modeling language is that the solver might decide dynamically how to linearize them. Moreover, the solver might use specific presolving techniques on this kind of constraints. For example, the two end constraints, one with variables x, y, z, and resultant r, the other on variables a, b and resultant z, can be reduced into a single end constraint with resultant r and variables x, y, a, b. This reduction, however, might not be recognized so easily if the same constraints were given in linear form. In other words, the use of higher level modeling constructs might provide additional insights. Domain propagation is a solving technique, which consists in iterating over constraints and deducing new variable bounds for given local bounds in a branch and bound search. This process can be iterated, when deductions have been found. It is repeated until some form of consistency is reached, in other words, until no further propagations can be made or until some working limit is hit. Reducing the local bounds is important to keep the search space of the current subproblem small. Domain propagation can often be formulated as a set of rules. For an end constraint, for example, there are four propagation rules. According to the first, if the resultant is 1, then all of the operator variables have to be 1. The second says that, vice versa, if all the operators are 1, then the resultant must be 1. By the third rule, if there's one operator which is 0, then the resultant has to be 0. Finally, if the resultant is 0 and all the operators are 1, except 1, then this has to fix to 0. This describes a way of dealing with such constraints inside a solver, but the question is still standing whether they can be linearized. There are two possible linearizations of an end constraint. One possible way to linearize an end constraint on n operators is with the constraint given by the sum of the operators minus the resultant less than or equal to n minus 1, together with a set of constraints of the form xi minus the resultant larger than or equal to 0, for each operator xi. These n plus 1 linear constraints are enough to give a valid linear formulation of an end constraint. You may pause the video and double check that this is indeed a valid linearization you will see that the only way that the resultant is 1 is when all operators are 1. In all other cases, the resultant has to be 0. Hence, this models an end constraint. Alternatively, the n inequalities for the operators can be aggregated into one constraint given by the sum of the operators minus n times the resultant larger than or equal to 0. In other words, an end constraint can be formulated by using only two linear inequalities. It's easy to check that the four propagation rules are also enforced by this linear formulation. Consider, for example, the second rule. This follows from the less equal constraint. If all the operators are 1, then they sum up to n. This implies that the resultant has to be 1, simply by propagation of the linear constraint. This does not require the knowledge of the higher level logical constraint. The advantage of using a linearization is that the logical structure will be directly embedded into the LP relaxation. It is not clear a priori which linearization is more favorable in practice. The stronger formulation leads to a tighter relaxation. Which is good. However, since it has more constraints and more non-zeros, the resulting LPs will be harder to solve which is a disadvantage. Knowing the higher level modeling construct, a MIP solver might start with the weak relaxation and add parts of the strong relaxation on the fly by a cutting plane mechanism. The next topic are indicator constraints. These represent another special type of constraints, which model if-then relations. The simplest case is given by the relation between two variables, in which, typically, x is a binary and y is a continuous. Such an indicator relation states that, if the binary is equal to 1, then the continuous has to be equal to 0, otherwise, it might take any value within its domain. Often this is also written in the format, x implies y equals 0, where x is called the indicator variable. In the general form, however, 
the indicator variable x implies not only the value of a single variable, but a whole constraint of the form a transposed x less than or equal to b. In other words, such a constraint is enforced when the indicator variable is 1, otherwise it can be relaxed. Indicator constraints can be used to enforce a subset of a set of constraints. For example, suppose we want that at least 5 out of 10 constraints have to hold. Then, each of these 10 constraints can be formulated as an indicator constraint with a different indicator variable. By taking the sum of the different indicators greater than or equal to 5, we can enforce that at least 5 constraints, it does not matter which ones, have to hold. Moreover, indicators can also be used for adding penalty terms when a certain constraint does not hold. In particular, the variable x can be added to the objective in such a way that, when it takes value 0, it implies an objective bound. For example, in a minimization problem, this can be done by subtracting, from the objective, the variable x multiplied by a large number. Finally, the same indicator variable can be used in different indicator constraints to model different scenarios. In particular, one indicator variable can be used to indicate different constraints, if it is used with value 0 for one of them, with value 1 for the other. Moreover, an indicator constraints can also be linearized by using a so-called Big M formulation, at least if there's an upper bound on the quantity A transposed X within the domains of X. If this is the case, then there exists an m such that b plus m is larger than any possible value of a transpose x. Then, this indicator constraint can be written as the linear constraint a transposed x less than or equal to b plus 1 minus y times m. In this formulation, if the indicator variable is 1, then the last part of the right-hand side vanishes, implying that a transposed x has to be bounded by b. Hence, the linear constraint has to hold. On the contrary, if y equals 0, then the bound b is enlarged by m, hence the constraint gets relaxed. In this case, indeed, a transposed x can take arbitrary values. When using big M formulations instead of indicator formulations in a model, the value of m has to be chosen carefully. A trivial choice is, of course, the maximum of ax minus b. However, even a much smaller value of m might be feasible. If there are other constraints in the model ensuring that a transposed x cannot grow arbitrarily large. At the same time, a too small m might lead to unwanted situations, in which, for example, solutions are cut off. In other words, the big M value is best decided with knowledge that the user has of the problem. The propagation of these two constraints, either the indicator constraint or the linear one, is theoretically the same, but numerically, it might be quite different, since big M formulations are known to be numerically cumbersome. Consider, for example, the very simple big M constraint y less than or equal to 1 million times x, with x being binary. Then, the solution given by x equals 10 to the minus 6 and y equals 1 is feasible for this constraint within typical numerical tolerances of MIP solvers. Moreover, due to numerical tolerances of the solver, it would also be considered integer, since x is close enough to the integer 0. That's one of the problems that might occur when using big M formulations. The same would not happen if we used indicator constraints. On the other hand, however, indicator formulations often solve slower, because the information about these constraints is not present in the LP relaxation. Consequently, LP relaxations of indicator formulations are often weak. To conclude, big M should be chosen carefully, and it is usually worth trying both variants, indicators and big M's. This lecture concludes with assorted advice on what you should and especially what you shouldn't do while modeling mathematical optimization problems. First of all, something that should be avoided is making assumptions on the structures that a MIP solver can recognize. As a real example from a company application, Consider a flow model with some per-node flow conservation constraints, capacity constraints on some subsets of the edges and with a layered network structure. In other words, the network is structured in subsets of nodes, or layers, and the flow is only between those, but never within a layer. Moreover, the capacity constraints create cuts in between these layers. Now, suppose the modeler doesn't give bounds on the flow variables, arguing that they would follow from the structure of the network, 
which is correct in combinatorial terms. However, these bounds would not be easily recognized by the MIPS solver. Indeed, as a rule of thumb, MIPS solvers are great in making deductions from a single constraint or pairs of constraints, but they are typically weak to make such deductions from a specific combinatorial structure, that is only implicitly captured by hundreds of constraints. Essentially, the MIPS solver doesn't see the graph, in particular special structures in that graph. What the solver would be able to detect here is that this model has some network flow, but no more than this. Hence, what a modeler should learn from this is that additional information about the problem should always be passed, if possible, to the solver. In this case, this would be tight variable bounds on the individual arcs. At the same time, extra information given to the solver should not destroy the structure of the model. This might easily happen, for example, for symmetries. Indeed, a MIPS solver can typically recognize and explore symmetries in the model, hence breaking them by hand often does more harm than good, since they would only be broken incompletely. In contrast to the previous example, symmetry breaking is a dual reduction, while bound tightening is a primal reduction. Primal reductions are usually helpful and hardly ever harmful. Individualized dual reductions are to be taken with more caution. Another common mistake that occurs in too many models is the usage of arbitrarily large big M's, which the solver cannot reduce by itself. Consider as one practical example from an industry application a model with piecewise linear functions, where the last point in the piecewise linear function was big M and big M squared. And as you can imagine, this gave a horrible linear relaxation. When trying to incorporate this into the LP, the corresponding big M's were used there in the objective and in various constraints. When we pointed this out to the modeler, they realized that, with M being 1000 instead of 10 billion used initially, the model solved much more stably and was still correct. After the do nots, here are now some do's. How does a good model look like? There is no perfect answer to this question, let's collect some thoughts. First, Compact is not always better. Indeed, there are huge models, which have millions of variables, that solve within seconds, as well as smaller models, with less than 50 variables, that do not solve in days with any of the state-of-the-art MIP solver. Ideally, the LP optimum should be close to the integer optimum. This is particularly met with respect to the quality of the solution, not so much the geometric distance of the two points. For a tight LP formulation, there are much better chances of solving to optimality quickly. Next, a small number of fractionals in the LP solution is A+. After solving a model, the MIP solver typically reports the number of integer variables that take fractional solution values in the optimal LP solution. A small value for this number is usually a good indicator that it will be relatively easy to find an integer solution with a few branches or cuts. Moreover, fixing variables ideally has an impact on other variables, to enable domain propagation and shrink the size of the local search space. In other words, there should not be too many degrees of freedom in the model. Moreover, numerics will be kept under control, meaning that the model should not have a too large span of coefficients. Precisely, as a rule of thumb, there should not be more than six orders of magnitude for a single row or column, and not more than 9 over the whole model. To this end, also big M formulations should be avoided, if possible. One of the things to keep in mind is that, often, the first modeling attempt is infeasible or unbounded. This is, in a certain sense, a good thing, because it allows to learn from the faulty model. MIPS solvers are typically extremely fast in detecting trivial errors, which means that a tiny mistake in the beginning does not lead to a big waste of time. Later, feasible versions of the model might produce feasible solutions for the model that might not fit the original application. For example, they might violate some constraints that were forgotten. It works in the modeler's favor that MIP solvers, with their focus on optimization, prefer extreme solutions. If the model leaves some backdoor to do something unintended, the MIP solver will exploit this and come up with a solution that doesn't make sense for the application. Again, this is a good thing, since this makes debugging a model easy. At the same time, also for correct models, customers often don't prefer extreme solutions. Hence, 
you should always keep in mind that often there are alternative optima or solutions that, although being probably a few percent away from the optimality of the model, might meet more of the requirements of the customers. In other words, these alternative solutions might fulfill some robustness conditions that the customer has in mind. If you are able to come up with such alternative suggestions, this will often work in your favor. Try to stress test the model is another good practice to keep in mind. Often, the actual mathematical model and the data to put into it is separated. Hence, the user should try inputting data that is extreme, whatever this means for the specific application, and check whether the solutions produced by the MIP solver cover such corner cases. Also, the reported solutions, when suboptimal, should always be ensured to be at least too optimal. This means that, if the modeler presents a solution to a practitioner, and the practitioner can easily spot that by switching two decisions a better objective can be obtained, then the modeler is in serious trouble. If a trivial improvement is overseen, this undermines the trust in the approach. Finally, Always keep in mind that a solution is only optimal or feasible or infeasible with respect to the model. It might happen that, when presenting an optimal solution, the customer might say that it can be somehow slightly improved. This might be correct and due to the fact that a model is only an abstraction of reality, and we can, of course, only compute optimal solutions with respect to the model itself. Another reason might be that data often comes from sampling and there might be some inaccuracies already. In other words, the meaning of an optimal solution should not be overestimated, even if it is perfectly fine in a mathematical sense. Moreover, some slight violations might still be tolerated. As a consequence, exact optimality of the model solution is not really required in many practical applications. A solution that is 1% away from optimality might also be fine, since this gap might be small in comparison to the uncertainty of the data. Finally, the modeler should always be prepared for a pushback, while trying to bring an optimization solution into practice. You should be aware that often people have been working on the project that you are now optimizing. They will already have some smart procedures in place. You must now convince them that the optimization solution is really better. When doing so, you should be prepared that not all people might like the change in their environment. And be prepared for the final quiz of today. First question. A product of binary variables. A is a nonlinear structure and requires an MNAP solver. Or B needs to be linear approximated by the modeler. Or C is a structure that many MIP servers support. Second question. Indicator constraints model A. If then relations. B. If then else relations. Or C if and only if relations. And third questions, what is a good rule of thumb to keep numerics under control? A, don't mix continuous and integer variables in one constraint. B, don't mix inequalities and equations in one model. Or C, don't use coefficients that span more than six orders of magnitude. Think about the answers. Here we go. A product of binary variables. It's a structure that many MIP servers support. That's an end constraint. Classical indicator constraints model if then relations. And finally, a good rule of thumb to keep numerics under control is to not use coefficients that spend more than six orders of magnitude within one constraint. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. See you later for the Q&A and the exercise session. Bye-bye.